Mr. McGee, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. You are about to listen to the totally super awesome 80s reboot overdrive podcast. This podcast is our fan tribute to the Incredible Hulk TV show. Be advised that has been exposed to radiation and we caution to listen at your own risk. You have now entered Gamma Cast. Professor Esser, and with me as always is the incomparable, the fantastic, the brilliant, the wonderful, the beautiful. 80s music girl. That's her. I knew she was here. Hello, yeah. 80s music girl. Welcome to tonight's episode, season five, episode one. I tell you, the um, numbering of episodes is always very odd, but we're going to go with yeah. the IMDb number, and apparently now we're in episode five. We're in season five. I had no idea. Me uh, neither. <laughs> so apparently, welcome to season five, episode one, The Phenom. Uh, David Bedecker, which sounds like he just ran, he wanted to say one name and then changed it like halfway <laughs> yeah. through. I'm David yeah. Bedecker. That, that, Bedecker, Bedecker, that's my name. David Bedecker. Um, yeah. Travels to Miami with a farm boy with potential to be a baseball star and has to protect the boy from an unscrupulous manager. Our mm-hmm. director tonight is David McEvity. Or okay. Evity. And, of course, our writer tonight is the incomparable Ruben Letter who wrote last uh, week's episode, and again, uh, Kenneth Johnson, who developed the whole dang thing. Yes. Um, this, this was an interesting episode, if for nothing else, uh, for me at least, is its uh, parallels to Bull Durham. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it is fascinating how, and... Here's what I'm going to tell you, just straight up, without knowing anything about the honesty or truth of any aspect of it. Um, You know, I think this is the 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 sexual qualifications of uh, of um, relationships. that we see in Bull Durham and that we see in here probably are <laughs> not without merit in the uh, actual baseball league. Um, wow. Maybe maybe I'm going to get maybe I'm going out on a limb on that, but I'm I'm going to say that man, that seems like if you wanted to, you know, here's the thing: young baseball <laughs> stars are young people, <laughs> um, men and women. Of various groups, and uh, mostly men, sh- certainly at this point in our history. But I have to say, I can imagine that sexual dynamic being being exploited both for personal aggrandizement in um, Bull Durham and uh, for professional aggrandizement, as we see in tonight's episode. Um. Uh, though we do have a redemptive arc for our uh, sexually exploited young woman. Yes. Yes. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm looking for uh, our uh, sports writer here because he had pre. He was just a few moments ago here um, in the 80s in the Incredible Hulk as a drunk of another sort. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I wanted to confirm that before I said it out loud. Yes, there he is. He was from the fast lane. He was Callahan, our drunken driver for the mob. Yeah. Uh, back in the fast lane a few weeks he ago. He plays a good drunk. Well, you know what? You know what? You know what? And here's what I'll tell you. Here's why he was a good drunk. Because mm-hmm. he was a drunk who clearly understood he was still working. 
Yeah. You know, I will always say this about my father. My father, who was an alcoholic, um, you know, I I always have a weird feeling when people talk about their alcoholic fathers because my Mm -hmm. alcoholic father was also a workaholic. Yeah. And as my mother once said, you know, uh, she was fascinated by the fact that my father was a workaholic. And as, as far as the fact that he was an alcoholic, she didn't know there were any men who weren't alcoholics. Um, right. But yeah. the workaholic aspect was very fascinating. And this idea we get in this episode is about the workaholic-alcoholic uh, combination, the man who has standards and work to do but who at the same time is trying is 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 combating his 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 beloved demon Mm -hmm. that's the thing it's like the demon in his life isn't an athema it is what he wants but he does Mm -hmm. know that he has to deliver copy as well and right. uh, David, poor old David uh, Bedecker, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> finds himself in this position of being both, hey, you want to actually write for me since I'm too drunk to write? And <laughs> yeah. also helping this poor kid out. And it's like, man, you know. Yeah. You know, and for what it's worth, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's. It is such an annoying position for David to be. Yeah. Uh, the star of the show. Because it, yeah. it does seem like, man, everything has to happen because I wound up showing up here, you know? <laughs> exactly. You, you, you for me to come here. <laughs> you know, if he weren't so scientifically minded, he might start to wonder about the nature of his existence. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Because literally everything uh, occurs in this way, but here he is. He is picked up from by some young uh, farm farm boy mm-hmm. who cannot read. No, not a lick. Not a lick. And you know, it's a weird aspect of that because one does wonder. You know, by this point in history, in 1980, 81, in 1981, yeah. were there really that many people who could not read? But you know what? At the right. same time, I think back in 1980s, how many PSAs I saw about people who couldn't read. So, Right, you exactly. Know, it's a weird thing where it's like, man, you know, that knowledge was kind of secondary in my life but yeah Yeah. i guess there were a significant number of people who lacked that right and And, you know the way he justified that was you know he had to work on the farm and uh apparently there were a lot of times when he got pulled out of school taking Mm -hmm. care of his younger siblings and Working on the farm, and you know, after a while, you just say, "What the heck?" Yes, I, I, I farm. I don't need to read. Well, exactly. Although now mm. farming is very technological as an industry. Yes, yes, it is. Honestly, farming has one. become as technological <laughs> as you know any Sil- Silicon Valley startup, um, which mm-hmm. is always interesting because. You know, for what it's worth, if you're a farmer, you're a very results-based person. Yes. You know, you yes. don't you don't cotton to you know. Well, what do the myst- you know what do the mystics say? You say, well, I don't care what the mystics say. <laughs> no pun I, intended, right? Yeah. Well, you know, it's like you know, dude, I need to get these crops in today, and so if gamma radiation is going to help me, let's get some gamma in. <laughs> uh, just to tie it back to the Hulk for five minutes. Um, there you go. Because that is why we're here. Yes, but um, <laughs> young, uh, what's it, what's his actual name aside from the phenom? Um, yeah. Uh, Joe. It's Joe. Uh, Brett Cullen, I believe. Joe Dumming. Well, Brett Cullen, yeah, that's that's yeah. his name, but the, you know, the actual name of the character is Joe. Yeah, Joe Dumming. Yes. Um. 
Still a good looking man. Oh wow. Oh this guy works all over the place. Oh man, he's in he is in Narcos right now. He is Arthur Crosby. And he is mm. in um which is I know a big show on Netflix right now. He was in Purchase of Interest as Nathan Ingram. Oh man, this this yeah, this guy, you know, you always know an actor is like beloved when mm-hmm. you are running through his IMDB and you just see the same name repeated. Yeah. Um, oh, he was in Under the Dome. Ah, uh, you know, I nice. really loved Under the Dome for like a week, uh, for like about like six months, and then I was like, ah, uh, okay. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, so he is a great actor, still working, um, which right. is fascinating to me because honestly, when I'm watching him and he's playing the big dumb guy, uh, mm-hmm. you almost felt he wasn't acting. But I guess it I guess it shows how good of an actor he is is that you know when you're playing the big dumb guy and you make you think oh this this is a guy who's not acting he's like oh dude he was totally acting the whole time that was all a thing <laughs> and it's like wow okay so good he's for Joe good Brett. yeah good good for Brett Cullen um have his own show yeah you know I really enjoyed um that that aspect of it uh you know first off i'm i'm a big i'm a big i don't want to say i'm a big baseball fan but i do yeah. like when base so for example my favorite team is the tigers if you ask me where the tigers are right now i could i could not tell you okay. um i love the tigers they are my team and mm-hmm. i will always root for the tigers anytime i flip the channels and see the tigers going i'll say go tigers because the tigers <laughs> are uh, the best team in baseball, even if they don't win, it's the only time they don't win is because they don't want to. That is what yeah. I have headcanoned for that myself about the Tigers. <laughs> well, well, let me. I actually have empirical evidence for this, which is that every year that the Yankees won the World Series, they had mm-hmm. a losing record to the Tigers. Mm-hmm. Wow! And I've always headcanoned this as the Tigers knew the Yankees were going to win anyway. Yeah. So they said, you know what? We don't want to put in all that overtime to get to the World Series because you know they make you play extra games. You know, there's mm-hmm. also some extra it's work at night, to do. Yeah, and exactly. it's in October when it's cold. Exactly. It's not a good exactly. gig to go all the way to the World Series. So I'll tell you what. How about we just beat the guy who we know is going to win the World Series every time, <laughs> and just you know we'll beat them. And then we're just going to lay back it with the rest of the week. Because we beat that guy who won. So, exactly. you know, you will always be the best team in baseball. Because every time they showed up and we beat them, yeah, they wound up winning. That's mostly because we kind of blew off everybody else. <laughs> um, uh, and that was during the 90s. And, and, and here's what I'll tell you. The one year the Tigers had a losing record to during that that nineties period. Actually, I think it was, I want to say it was two thousand and one. The Yankee, the mm-hmm. Tigers had a losing record to the mm. Yankees, and that was the year the Diamondbacks won. Wow! Because, yeah, you know, because the terrorists won that year. Um, <laughs> I will never forget that because. Um, it was a daily show bit at that time was, uh, you know, th- that weird emphasis we put on sports teams. Um, because, of course, you know, it was after 9-11. The Yankees yes. win the World Series. So the Yankees have to win the World Series for America, even though they're playing yeah. against other American teams. And they're yeah. going up against the Diamondbacks from Arizona, who are like, we're just a team of baseball players. We're not trying to cause any problems, but they wind up winning. And, you know, that means, of course, the terrorists won. Oh. Right. Was that the year that Randy Johnson was pitching for the Diamondbacks? Um, possibly. I know that the yeah. Di- Diamondbacks, here's the thing, the Diamondbacks were an expansion team. Expansion teams always get the first pick. Yeah. You know, so and Randy like, used to play for us. He played for the Mariners. He was part of that big uh, to do in yeah, you, know, you know the late late nineties, early two thousands. You know, yeah, with yeah. Edgar Martinez and Joey Cora and Ken Griffey Jr. And yeah, so yeah. he was quite a big deal. And then when he got traded, it was like, <gasps> no. 
although what's weird for me is that as a Tigers fan, even though I am such a casual Tigers fan, I mm-hmm. so personally despise the Yankees. I don't know why. <laughs> it's like, I don't know why I hate them mm-hmm. so much. A lot um, of people do. Yeah. And my daughter loves them. And I'm just like, I I don't know. We've, we've sent her to a few uh, Yankee Mariners games for her birthday. And uh, she's never actually gone with anyone that was a Yankees fan. They were always Mariner fans. Yeah, well, so. you know, I mean, it's... It is weird our obsession with sporting teams, but you know, I I guess that that comes from the. I think that's an in an, an inherent human thing, because otherwise mm-hmm. the Olympics wouldn't be a thing. Right. Um. You know, the Olympics originally created just to provide humans that distraction of competition <laughs> without actual war in which people die. Mm-hmm. You know, I think people created sports just to have a conflict mm-hmm. that could be resolved without anyone being dead at the end of it. Yeah. Yeah, and then someone invented that totally uh, makes sense. Australian rules football, and, you know. <laughs> and <laughs> it, it just all goes downhill from there. Okay, <laughs> but back to this actual episode. Uh, David gets picked up by some young man. Mm-hmm. Who basically puppy dog eyes him into having David be his, you know, caretaker. You yes. Because he no needs a keeper. Boy. Yeah, it's like, and you can see David the whole time is like, dude, I just got in your car, man. I'm trying to get somewhere. Exactly. And he, but of course, you know, the, the actor who is apparently a fantastic actor, Brett Cullen. Uh, is like, um, oh, I need you to help me out because I'm just so lost and not sure where I'm going. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Kind of like Roger Rabbit. Please. Yeah. Please, Eddie, <laughs> yes. Um, and, but, you know, I mean, here, here's the thing. I always say that Roger Rabbit actually was more in control of those situations. I yeah. am not sure that this character was in control of his situations. I, I, I don't think so. You know, yeah. I, honestly, I think the fact that he didn't sign his name stemmed directly from the fact that he could not sign his name. You know, yeah. It's, it's exactly. like when you get a functionally illiterate gentleman drunk and you ask him to sign his name, it's like, oh, yeah, you need yeah. to pull this out a few hours ago. Um <laughs> Um, but we do Will get, an X do? Yes. Um, <laughs> historically, it has. Um, yes. But of course, we do get uh, we do get our our nice little Hulk out there because um, uh, Joe is blowing the 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 scouting opportunity, um, and we do get our uh, guys in Hawaiian shirts because you know mm-hmm. this is the uh, Magnum PI era. It is coming. Yeah. If, if it is not already here, the zeitgeist it's coming. is here. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, huh. and they're in Florida. Yeah, and then, yeah, so. and it is Florida, yes. Yeah. So they do uh, attempt to beat up David, and then, of course, as soon as they turn their backs, there is a Hulk. And um, slowly walk down the hall so he could catch up. Yes. Well, you, know, <laughs> you never want to run too fast from a Hulk. You no. Know, you, you know, He'll just what, catch you anyway. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> Statistically speaking, when you're faced with a monster or any mm-hmm. other wild beast that may want to kill you, mm-hmm. you do want to walk away slowly. You do want to not draw attention to you. Because if you walk away quickly, it might think you're walking away quickly so that you can then circle around for an attack. Right. So the so when you're dealing with a monster, walk away slowly. And the monster may accept that as, okay, I don't need to eat you because you're not a threat. Right. You know? It's only how hungry remember the monster that, kids. is. Yeah. <laughs> remember that, kids. If you're ever faced by a Hulk, because remember the Hulk is really a, a banner, a Bruce banner. So if you do encounter a Hulk, just slowly walk away, show that you are no threat, and the Hulk will walk away too. Okay. Um... 
So anyway, when we get the Hulk in, he does smash through the door that breaks up that moment when uh, Eg- Exeter. Uh, um, <laughs> it's nice to see him again. Uh, I like that guy. He's great. Oh, he's fantastic. Robert Donner, who plays uh, Bernard Devlin. He is. I love his IMDb because his IMDb is him in a white sweater with a very light blue uh, collar, and it's like. When have you ever played a character who wore that costume? Oh, exactly. <laughs> when have you ever not been either the most frightening monster or, you know, just a cruel mo- person in your history? Just, but, well, you know, yeah. I guess, you know, but for what it's worth, I'm sure he is a guy who wanted to break away. I'm sure mm-hmm. that's what brought him to the Exeter role in Mork and Mindy was like, you know, I know I look like a murderous southern preacher. I'm actually a decent guy. I, I just want to work, you know? Um, you got to believe me. Yes, although I always loved him as Exeter, because, of course, Exeter yeah. in Mork and Mindy, he is the guy who is just schizophrenic enough to believe Mork. And... um that's oh you know what mm-hmm. uh, we're oh this is interesting okay yeah so first he's Mr. Bennett then he's Bernard Devlin yes this is the second episode with the Hulk just going through his IMDb mm-hmm. real quick yeah he was in the um in the carnival episode he was Mr. Benedict who again was the fiery preacher that was when everyone yeah. honestly he kind of got typecast after that he it's like. <laughs> Because in a way, I think maybe Exeter is kind of the parody of that role. You know, it's like, I'm the crazy preacher. But you know what? I'm actually talking to a literal alien from another planet. So what do I know? Um, So anyway, uh, the, uh, the he does not sign. The Hulk runs through. Yes. And we actually get an interesting moment because the Hulk does not only not only does the Hulk sober up our young uh, baseball player, but mm-hmm. our um, honeypot sort of realizes that this isn't what I want to do either. The Hulk is actually yeah. a pretty interesting um, force for directing you to change your life. Um, so good for yeah. us on that. Um, yeah. Because uh, Audrey, who I believe is played by Anne Lockhart, Anne Lockhart. Well, Audrey was a young woman here. Uh, Anne Lockhart, uh, still, uh, you know, um, she had played a very uh, attractive young woman in that. Oh, she, she does a lot of voiceovers, um, but she was in Law and Order. Oh, she keeps in. Wow, she has done a lot of Law and Orders as a player. She's. Um... She's the daughter of June Lockhart. Is she? Um, I thought she looks. She has a striking resemblance. I know. Uh, I wasn't sure if that was. Um, no, I know there's it, quite a few of them. Says, no? States that she was born to Anne Kathleen Maloney on oh. September 6, 1953, and grew up in Brentwood, California. Anne Lockhart is one of the very few actresses who can look back 100 years to trace her roots. Her roots, born in New York City, to one of theater's leading families, Anne is the fourth generation of performers to carry the Lockhart name. She see? follows. Yeah, well, let's see here. Uh, she Gotta follows great grandfather John Coates Longhart, grandparents Jean Lockhart and Kathleen Lockhart, and her mother June Lockhart. Yeah, okay, so what's June Lockhart? Da da da. So <laughs> how is she born to Kathleen Lockhart? Oh, I guess I guess I guess the Lockhart's the professional name. Right. So uh, you know, yeah, but That's she true. has worked a lot. And that's, that's good. good. For her. Well, you know, it's, that's a good strong. You know, that's a good strong Hollywood family from back in the day. Oh, so she is. She is the dispatcher on Chicago Fire. I love that she has a lot of pos- positions where she's not necessarily the person, 
but she's always there. Um, mm -hmm. So she's nice. uh, the dispatcher on Chicago Fire. She's the policewoman on Law and Order Criminal Intent. Um, hmm. You know, um, yeah, she, but yeah, you know, I always love when I see these actors who get a lot of work. So it makes me, it makes me feel good that, um, performance is actually a per, an actual profession where one can have a job. Yes. I mean, granted it's all contract work, but you know, it is, yeah. it is nice to see, nice to see her getting all the, all these credits, you know? Oh, yeah. she, uh. Look at that. She, that's weird. Uh, I mean, I mean, it's not <laughs> that weird, but uh, she was the voice of Storm on Spider-Man and, and his amazing friends. Um, really? Very yes, cool. You know, uh, I guess she put on her African accent and she was Storm. And, nice. Uh, but she actually Hard to did, pick one of those up. Yeah, she actually did a lot of uh, roles on. She did four different roles on Spider Man and His Amazing Friends, mm. and uh, of course was on. Oh, she was Diane Westmore twice. On, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, she was Diane Westmore and Brenda McCutcheon on mm. Magnum PI. Oh. oh, she was Lieutenant Sheba, recurringly on Battlestar Galactica, which I just watched this morning or this evening. Ah. Yeah. Now, are we talking the original or yeah, the, the original, new one? The original, the original. Oh, cool! With with it's um, all the original. Okay. Anyway, oh that's enough about our young <laughs> uh, honeypot. And um, yes. You know, it is such an interesting aspect. This. This this honeypot character, this idea of getting the guy stuck in in the honeypot, as they say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, how much it does change their their dynamic when the Hulk shows up, and suddenly she doesn't want to be the honeypot anymore. Yeah, she I wants to be a baseball player. Uh, well. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, uh, who's to say that that's better? <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, that's that's. Uh, you know, I guess she's anticipating the dawn of reality television and thinks this is this is what you got. <laughs> but there at the same go. time, she also was just really impressed by a man doing a minimal amount of human effort to acknowledge her existence as a fellow human. And in 1981, that was enough to make you want to just fall head over hill, heels over someone. It's like, you actually recognize me as a human being worth saving? Everything about my yeah. life up until this point has been a lie. I am 100% com yeah. committed to you. Uh, I try not to judge uh, historical documents like TV shows from modern understandings of things, but... Hmm. Yeah, I mean that is the crux of it. Is that yes, the uh, <laughs> the guy stood up to a Hulk, and uh, that makes her realize it was a mistake to be with uh, um, Brendan Devlin. Um, yes, I love that they named him Devlin because Devlin, of course, means yes. devil. And yeah. uh, when you have a guy who makes you sign a contract. Uh, whose name is Devlin. Bad idea. Yeah. Bad idea. If you're going to get into contract law and your last name is Devlin or Deb or anything starting with a D, um, <laughs> or if you're like D. Evel, um, you know, yeah. like, create a, 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 a uh, nom de guerre um, <laughs> as opposed to a nom de plume. Um <laughs> A nom de plume means it's the name you write under. A nom de guerre means it's the name you work under. Guerre, of course, actually meaning war, which means the name in which you commit war. But, of course, guerre also can mean work uh, in that context. So, yes, you want a new nom de guerre rather than something that immediately invokes, I am the devil, please sign my contract. Um, <laughs> because that can only go so far. Um mm. Anyway, moving right on from there. Um, the guy doesn't sign the contract, and there is yeah. this 
desire to have uh, him continue to sign the contract. But, of course, we get our uh, big guys in Hawaiian shirts uh, trying to force him to sign the contract. Yes. In classic Suge Knight fashion. But uh, they do once again run into David, who everyone thinks is acting as his agent. As a side note, uh, our drunken sports writer wants David to be his ghostwriter. Yeah. Um, which is also kind of a weird thing. That Both that weird... David did do the writing that was that was like, <laughs> well, I guess I got to write this guy's article. Yeah. Um, um, which so is so bizarre that he actually accepted that. Yeah. Well, like, you know, what? David, I, I I really don't know what David's. I think David is kind of out of his element right now in this baseball world. <laughs> it, let's be honest. So. He's a nerd. He didn't play a lot of sports. No. So yeah. right now he's like, oh goodness, we have what is, are you telling me? I have to do this. Do I actually have to do that? Have we entered into a contract? I don't know. But it also <laughs> is about his friend. So he says, well, let me help this guy out. No, honestly, for what it's worth, he has no idea if this guy is really his friend. Right. You know, this is a guy who picked him up, you know, for all he knows, this guy's also a raging racist, you know, it just hasn't come mm-hmm. up yet. You know, it's like, mm. but David does what's best for the story because he is the, the lead character and that's what you do when you're the lead character, you do what's best for the story. Yeah. And, um... You know, he does serve as this guy's surrogate. And then when it does start to, after he prevents him from signing, and then they try mm-hmm. to prevent him from coming to the game, which gets to us, what, what, which gets to us, what, what I think the writer's in central moment was, which was to have the whole kid of baseball out of the park. Yes. Yes, that's, it's that's really our really good job. In all of this. And yeah. uh, at the end of it, um, you know, our young man is getting signed to a team. He's got the former honeypot, now a true blue girlfriend, at his arm. Mm. And, of course, our drunken sports writer has entered into the world of agency. Yes. So everyone gets a piece of the pie. So, yeah, you know, all's well that ends well, I guess. Um I suppose. <laughs> Any final thoughts on tonight's episode, the Finam uh, Rose? I actually, I think it it was definitely a different episode. I appreciated the fact that um, David even got involved with a little catch at the beginning, because this kid obviously lives and breathes baseball, so. Why not park on the side of the road to look at this perfect baseball diamond? Let's play some catch and have these little kids watch us. And uh, truly, the kid is phenomenal. He almost took David's arm off a couple times while he was pitching to him. (laughs) But um, I, I appreciated, you know, that it was a different aspect of life. It was, you know, sports related. It was actually something that people could, you know, kind of sink their teeth into is baseball and and uh you had the the Devlin guy that wanted him and wanted to corrupt him and then of course he had his little minion there to uh get the job done for him. But um there was one part of the and I always kind of hone in on these little tiny side aspects of things that I'm watching. Uh, David went out when they came back from his practice, from Joe's practice. He went out to, well, actually, it came back from dinner, and he went out to get ice to put on Joe's arm and a milkshake. So, of course, when he comes back, that took forever. Uh, He meets up with drunken sports writer guy and takes him back to his hotel room where he's coerced into writing his piece for him until, you know, Mm -hmm. unless, you know, the guy gets fired. 
So here's this bag of ice and milkshake sitting in this chair all night long. And, of course, you see the bag the next day. There's just, like, pristine. It's just <laughs> the minute he put it in the chair, I'm like, that sucker should be soaking wet. Yeah, well, you with know. With milkshake dripping out. But I'm well, a weirdo like that. It just it just bugged me like the whole time. He's like, no, he can't write your stupid article. He's got to get the ice and milkshake back to you. <laughs> what is wrong with you, inconsiderate old drunk? I, no. I, I suppose if there's an <laughs> argument, it's just that it was already melted. So writing the extra stuff isn't going to cause uh, additional problems. You know, it's I like it's bubble it, buster. You yeah, the the, the <laughs> deed is done. Help me out, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Really good episode. And for, for a split second, when he offers him the money to do for the writing, and he says, this is not negotiable, take this $100, and David takes it. You know, because usually he has pretty strong convictions about taking money from people. You know, which goes on to facilitate our beliefs and the fact that he has a Swiss bank account somewhere. Yeah. But, but when he agreed to continue to write for him, I thought, wait a minute, you ever be like in a lab in Miami or something? Yeah. I know you need a job, but the lab actually has everything that you need to, you know, continue your research. This guy, you're just writing his column for him. But it looked like there was actually an instance where David really needed the money. Yes. Well, I think that here's the thing. I will always say that David needs cash. Yes. That even if he has, you know, offshore accounts that he can access through rather complex means in 1981. Yeah. Even if he has a million dollars in trust somewhere, he's always Mm -hmm. cash poor. Yeah. So to that extent, I do I do get his need for the money, and mm-hmm. you know for what it's worth with David, I think the idea of running is always against who he is. Mm-hmm. You know, I think he's always looking to find a way to solve problems, and knowing he has a yeah. Hulk actually helps him have the confidence to solve those problems. When you right. get to the idea of him trying to solve the problem away from the Hulk, yeah, it's never a motivation for him. Because, you know, not for nothing, if you were suddenly the strongest creature ever to live, you like it a bit. Even if it's not what you exactly what you want, it's probably right. very self-satisfying. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, 80s Music Girl, uh, if anyone would like to reach out to you about the wonders of the 80s, uh, the Hulk, and all things inclusive, uh, where can they find you? I am at 80s Music Girl on Twitter, 80s Music Girl on Instagram, and 80s Music Girl on Facebook. Very good. And, of course, you can always write to me in that old-fashioned email way at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word, at gmail.com. And, of course, follow me on Facebook when I do get around to tweeting things at Charlie Esser. That's C-H-A-R-L-I-E-E-S-S-E-R. Look for the two E's in the middle for quality. Ah, thank you for joining us once again, ladies and gentlemen, and good night. <laughs> We hope you've enjoyed this show. This podcast is part of the 80s Reboot Overdrive channel on Southgate Media Group. You can follow us on Facebook on the 80s Reboot group page. We're also on Twitter and Tumblr at 80s Reboot. We invite you to check out all the wonderful podcasts and blogs available at southgatemediagroup.com. And thank you for reliving the 80s.